I will not be attempting to sew with my own hair, but let me know if you try it. <laughs> Darning is the art or method, it is not in itself a stitch, by which new threads are supplied in place of the thin or worn out ones, being in fact the prevention and cure of holes, and to describe it accurately it may be called hand weaving, or an imitation of the process adopted in the manufacture of materials. Darning, a method of mending, was an essential skill for the arsenal of any Victorian. Clothing was expensive, most people only possessed a handful of things which had to be taken care of to ensure they lasted as long as possible. The mindset of make do and mend might resonate mostly with us in a 20th century war mindset, like this booklet I own, which is a reprint of an edition from 1943 by the Ministry of Information. It addresses clothes rationing and accepts that no doubt there are as many ways of patching or darning as there are of cooking potatoes. The book declares that clothes must now last longer, but it is the skill of making them last well that it hopes to pass on. This resonates with the idea that patching or darning, I'll refer to them in the encompassing mending from now on, is not simply a temporary solution to a problem, but rather a skill which allows a new life to a garment. That mending can be executed as an art. I thought it was longer for you that I learned this skill. Almost a year ago, I purchased this Victorian shawl online. It is a beautiful black wool with embroidery and beading. However, it was heavily discounted, I believe it was something akin to $20, because it had been a feast for moths. There was hardly a handspan of the shawl without a hole. Nevertheless, it captured my attention and I purchased it with the intention of making it a long-term mending project to bring it back to its old life. It is the motivation behind my desire to learn mending properly, not the ill-informed impulse mending I've done before on pajama bottoms or split leggings. I want this mending to be up to Victorian standards. I want the shawl to be as close to what it could have been when it was first made. So I thought I would learn a handful of different techniques with you here today and then see which one will work best to mend this beautiful shawl. Now I must first be honest, I have attempted to darn some of the holes on this shawl already but I struggled immensely because I have not practiced the technique enough and because I was even bl weaving black thread on black wool and I couldn't see properly, I felt really Victorian <laughs> and I could hardly imagine doing this work under candlelight at home. Thankfully, I am not Victorian, and I can be aided by modern technology to save my eyesight, which is much harder to mend than my shawl. Let's take a moment to talk about today's sponsor, Serious Readers. Serious Readers makes serious lights for all your serious needs. If you're a seamstress like me, you know the struggle of sewing with fading or insufficient light. There is a solution out there. <laughs> this is the Serious Light, the high definition model. It uses daylight wavelength technology, which replicates the daylight spectrum as close as technically possible. It is incredibly adjustable, you can change the focus, the strength of the light, and it has an adjustable head and arm, which can contort the light to any project. I chose a cordless option because it works plugged in, but also on a battery, which means I can easily pick it up and move it around. For example, I have no lighting in the corner of my sewing room where I do my ironing, which makes it very hard to do. But now I can just pick up the light, move it and voila. I had put away my shawl project because I wasn't sure how to tackle it. It wasn't only the lack of practice, but how hard it was to see to achieve the high standard of mending that I wanted to replicate. Now that I have appropriate lighting, I can revisit. Each Sirius Light is manufactured in the UK and comes with a five-year warranty. You can also use the offer code SR212 to receive a free compact light with any purchase in the Sirius Lights range and free international shipping. I also have a compact light, which I use whenever I'm knitting, crocheting, embroidering, reading, anything <laughs> on the sofa. Now that we are properly equipped for mending adventures, let's take a look at our instructions. For my project, the shawl, I think it will be best to weave in new threads rather than add patches. That would be adding new fabric to a very old piece. And in my head, it makes more sense to try and weave thread as a less obtrusive addition. The basis of my learning will be guided by this book called Needlework for Student Teachers by Amy K. Smith. This edition is from 1899, and, but is already the fifth edition, which shows that this book was popular. A little bit about the context of this book. This isn't an instruction manual for your home dressmaker. Um, this is 
to instruct student teachers, which means uh, women that were set out, mostly women, that were set out to teach young girls, uh, mostly young girls, for practical needlework. That is not decorative embroidery stitches, but what was called at the time practical needlework, which was the old kinds of stitches and sewing that would be useful for household management. That included mending linens, mending clothing, making linens and clothing, keeping them, washing them, all that kind of knowledge. But keep in mind that this book is advising teachers, which means this is the highest standard. This is what the teacher should be teaching. So I thought that would be the perfect companion to today's adventures. It also includes an introduction by the Lady Wolferton, which I think is so cool. Our teacher, Amy, advises the following as some fundamental rules for darning. Begin at the left-hand side of the part to be darned. A, because it is easier to see any pattern that has to be repeated in the darn, and B, the hand does not cover the darning. Do not make a straight edge such as a square or an oblong, because all the strain has to be borne by one row of loops or threads, and another weak place will probably arise in consequence. Any shape which is irregular is good. A wave edge, a diamond, a rhomboid, or octagonal shape. The latter is to be recommended. We must, therefore, strive for an octagonal shape. Use a mending thread as much like the original material in color, texture, size, and stranding as it is possible to obtain. Thread is not made in the Victorian way anymore. <laughs> Be careful that whatever the nature of the darn, the mending must not in the slightest degree strain the material or cause the least pucker. Holding the thumb upon the thread as it is pulled through the material, it is a great help in keeping the work flat. Now let's cover materials. As instructed, I have tried to sort materials as close as possible to my shawl. It's not the Victorian times anymore, so we do have to concede a little bit on here. I know by feel and the time period that the shawl is made of a black woolen thread. I had a couple of options. I also considered using silk thread as woolen thread was hard to get, but I think I've, sell I've settled on this worsted wool thread from the very yarns. Now I'm first going to practice the technique with some planar thread on a planar fabric as it would be ridiculous for me to expect you to be able to follow along to learn darning while doing it in a notoriously tricky black thread on black fabric setup. So first, plain thread and plain fabric. You can also use a darning needle. These are typically longer and I think they work great. You can get them in different sizes. I have here ones labeled yarn darners and cotton darners. The main difference between them being the eye size as the yarn needs more room. I think I'll go with the smallest and thinnest of the cotton darners. Our book has a couple more specific instructions, including a description on how to thread the needle for any woolen mending that I could not figure out. But for now, we're going to note that it recommends that the material should be held over the first and second fingers, which should be a little distance apart from each other. The third finger and thumb can then hold the work firmly in place. The darning is worked in rows of threads, which are worked from the chest to the chest. From the chest to the chest? Do you remember the note earlier about shapes? The book includes some shapes to consider and says the fourth is the best, but the first the easier to teach. So we'll start with the first shape, which seems to be a diamond. For the first row, we must commence at the bottom left-hand side with the needle pointing from the chest, taking up one thread and missing one, till as many stitches are needed to form the pattern. In this case, since it's the sharp edge of the diamond, I'm only doing a handful. It also asks that you leave a tail at least a quarter of an inch long. The second row, we come back down with the needle pointing towards the chest with only one line of thread in between the previous row, as close as you can get it really. At the start, you're meant to leave a small loose loop. This is to allow for the thread to shrink in the wash without distorting and helps keep the flexibility of the fabric. I won't be washing the shawl, but I will learn this way nonetheless. Then you take up the threads that were passed over in the previous row of stitching, and then you just continue forming the pattern as best as you can until the section you needed to mend is completely covered. We're instructed that once we're successful at darning with taking and passing one thread, we should practice in taking two threads and missing two threads, as preparatory for darning on a material where one and one would be much too fine and unpractical for any use. In fact, further on, there is a specific set of instructions for darning a thin place on woolen material, which describes this exactly. It recommends two threads, never one, but I thought I would share the most common plain darning before mentioning the variation for woolens.
we've now reached the halfway point and I just wanted to talk to you about what what is going on because this doesn't look like the picture. So my purpose with drawing out the image, the pattern, um, and doing it like this much bigger is just to show you what it's meant to look like. I have reached a couple of issues. Number one, a disclaimer, I hate to break the fourth wall, but for me to get a really, really fine work, I have to be quite up close to it. And I can't do that if I'm filming because the camera is between me and that, or my head will be in the way when you're seeing. So my second attempt will be better, I'm sure. Then the other thing is that obviously, because I've drawn the shape so much bigger, the, the rows of stitching are further apart. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is that this darning needle is the finest that came in the cotton darners, but I think it's still not fine enough. So I imagine the Victorians had much, much um, thinner needles, um, which I think I'm going to do for my second attempt where I'm going to try to do the technique properly so you can see what it looks like, but going, passing one thread and um, taking one thread, I'm going to use my smallest needle, which I think is a size number 10 sharp, and just see how that goes. Obviously I'm using a contrasting thread so you can see and also that makes the stitches look more uneven but that's just how it is. This needle I think would be fine if you're doing uh, passing two, taking two, which is the next step but for one, taking one, passing one, it's just not fine enough. So I'm going to do a second sample with a finer needle and with the fabric like up here so I can um, really show you what it's meant to look like. So I have just finished my finer sample where I tried to do one take, one pass. Um, that is for the, the fabric threads. Um, it was much easier with a smaller needle. So the thing you have to keep in mind is the smaller and finer the needle, the smaller and finer the work. So I wanted to show you what it looks like. The diamond shape is, you know, a little dodgy, but I think the fineness is much, much better. And I also wanted to show you the loops at the end. And you have to be really careful to make sure that your loops are not too small nor too big. And then the effect on the other side. Now imagine if this was matching thread, that would be nearly invisible. So it's a really, really fine way to do it. And a couple of points I wanted to mention is that I think the hand position that they recommend is absolutely worth it. This does really help. And that I found it was much easier to keep consistent uh, when you're sewing away from the chest, um, so from the chest going up, then going down. Um, and that the, it was also way easier to do as many stitches as you can in one go, because once you pull through the thread and you have a thread hanging, it is much harder to do the next stitch accurately. Overall, I think this definitely has some practice to go. Keep in mind, I am not the teacher, I am the student. But I think we've got some really good potential here, so I think we can move on to the next stitch. Not stitch, to the next technique. That is it for the plain darning technique. This should help reinforce most worn out sections of clothing, and you can adapt it to your needs by picking the right thread and shape for your project, and give new life to your favourite pieces of clothing. Now I have an issue, well I have several issues, but most pressing is the fact that for my project, I am treating mostly moth-eaten holes and not worn out patches. This means there are straight up holes to fill, which becomes a little more complicated. But never fear, this was an issue addressed in the book too. Although their example is for mending a hole in stocking web for the example of stockings, a common issue in Victorian times, I'm sure, I think it'll work fine for my purpose too. So here is the plan. This plan merely forms a lattice work over the hole, thereby filling the gap and making no attempt to imitate the pattern of the web. Practice should have been given in canvas darning, the first one we did, and upon webbing as for a thin place before working the specimen. In fact, it is quite useless to attempt to mend a hole unless a thin place can be darned with the utmost regularity. Quite useless indeed. Thankfully, we've practiced darning a thin place a little. I've done a few more attempts off camera, but I imagine not enough for Victorian standards, but this will have to do. This has worked similarly to the plain darning, where you work in parallel rows of stitching up and down the hole, forming an uneven shape. This will create a grid of threads over the hole. However, once that first pass is done, you then bend the work around and you strengthen the hole. It recommends for at least a quarter of an inch above and below it. And you repeat the darning stitch, taking up two and passing over two. The instructions are slightly different for the stocking web as it involves avoiding the loops and making sure they're connected. 
that doesn't really matter to us here, but still useful if you're mending stockings. So for this demonstration, I have just made a little hole in my calico. This is the type of hole that is very common in the shawl that I'm going to be working on. So this is a technique I really need to get down. As I explained, this technique is very much the same as the previous one, except that you do a, another row going that way. And then over the hole, you have to kind of weave your threads. So I'm going to be using the darning needle because they did say that for this one, you can do a pass over two and take two. So we're also going to aim for a diamond shape again. I might just trace this out in pencil to make sure it's a little nicer while I practice how to do it by eye. Okay, so once you've finished your diamond or whatever irregular shape you wanted to try, it should look a little bit like this. So you can see on the other side that there are some threads now going over the hole. You have to be really careful when you're stitching to make sure that um, you don't warp or extend the hole. And now we do it, and then we turn it around like this. So this was the left and the right. We've turned it around and now we just do the shape again, but going this way and this way from left to right. I might do this off camera because my back is already killing me and my hand is cramping. BRB. The last one we'll look at is what the book calls a three-cornered tear, hedge tear or catch tear, which looks a little bit like a triangle cut rather than a hole. An interesting tip is that if the material you are to darn is shifty or has a tendency to fray, it recommends that you fasten the material wrong side uppermost, either upon a piece of paper or card, by which I take it means to baste it to paper. Another interesting recommendation is it is sometimes well to gently draw the edges of the tear together so that the threads may become as continuous as possible. This is occasionally an advantage, but it is not advice for children's practice. I'm going to count myself as children's practice. As if, and if chosen very fine sewing, cotton must be used. A hair from the head is an excellent substitute on dark dress material, being strong yet fine. I will not be attempting to sew with my own hair, but let me know if you try it. The book recommends for the sake of giving an exact idea as to the method of mending, it is well to practice the darning upon canvas without a slit, merely a pencil mark. So let's make it easy for ourselves and do just that. The darn is worked on the wrong side and, and you begin darning the salvage way of the material. You start about three eighths to the left and three eighths above of the edge of the cut and take two threads and miss two until about three eighths below the tear. Leave a slightly large gap then for plain darning such as two threads and continue the rows of stitching as before until about three quarters of the way through the tear. Then unthread the needle. Yes, it actually says that, unthread the needle. Turn the work around and begin darning the same distance from the tear and work over three quarters of the tear again. Then go back up to the beginning and finish that to match up with the other darning and then the rest.
Darning a portion of each side alternatively keeps the mending flatter and the corresponding edges of the tear in place, and so makes a more successful darn. I find it so impressive how detailed the instructions and methods are for darning, proving that mending was an exact practice for the Victorians. However, practices didn't change much. Nearly 40 years later, in the war pamphlet, much of the advice is the same, even to tack a three-corner tear over paper. Enjoy now some calming footage of some of my attempts to mend this over 100-year-old shawl. And that is it for today. I hope you enjoyed learning those three ways to darn and mend your beautiful clothing. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you so much to Serious Readers for sponsoring this video. Remember you can use the code SR212 for a free compact light and free international shipping with any purchase in the Serious Light range. And I will be here darning this shawl probably for the next foreseeable future.